zu dem Vortrag Welcome to the Jungle, a Safari through the JVM Landscape. Ähm, das ist bestimmt einiges, was ihr schon kennt, aber ich hoffe, da sind auch viele Sachen dabei, die ihr nicht kennt. Mein Name ist Gerrit Grunwald, ich arbeite für Azul als Senior Developer Advocate. Ähm, ich leite die Java User Group in Münster und ja, ich freue mich hier zu sein. Ist ja nicht so schlecht. Hier drin ist schön kühl, draußen ist ja relativ warm. Ähm, fangen wir mal an, ne? Die Slides könnt ihr kriegen, was ist da los? Könnt ihr kriegen hier, wenn ihr die haben wollt. Ansonsten kann man die, glaube ich, auch hochladen. Das weiß ich nicht genau, muss ich Richard nochmal fragen, aber da kriegt ihr die auch. Oder wenn ihr sie anders haben wollt, dann pingt mich an. Ich bin am Asul-Stand, da könnt ihr die auch so kriegen. <lacht> OpenJDK. Wer lässt bei sich OpenJDK laufen? Glaube ich nicht. OpenJDK ist ein Projekt auf GitHub ist der Source Code. Was ihr laufen lasst, ist eine Distribution, also das heißt ein Bild von OpenJDK. Und das ist ein Unterschied. Nein, ich nehme jetzt keine Fragen an. Nachher. Oh, ich wollte auf Englisch wechseln, richtig? <lacht> um, OpenJDK is a free and open source implementation of the Java Standard, a uh, platform standard edition, or short, Java SE. And it has a website that you can find here, right? OpenJDK.org. And the source code is also available, and you can find it here, github.com slash openjdk slash jdk. If you're interested in how the JDK works, you can take a look at that, but be aware it's not easy. It's quite complex. So it is open source, means there are contributors to that project, and you might be uh, wondering who is all contributing to that project, and it's a lot of companies. And I have one point there, many individuals, because there are also individuals contributing to OpenJDK. But you see there are really big companies like Alibaba, Amazon. Azul is not so, so big, but we also uh, provide code there, uh, Bellsoft, Datadog, and so on, you, you name it. All these companies are contributors to the OpenJDK project, which is a really good thing, because that means you are on the safe side, right? This is not a one-man show, which is good. So it's not only Oracle doing stuff at OpenJDK. That's the first thing. There is, of course, also a roadmap to that project. And the older ones remember this release cadence, right? Where we had four and a half years between six and seven. And then it was three years from seven to eight. And then that means you have to wait years before you can test something new. And it took a long time in these days when you have a new release of a JDK to really switch to the new version because you get the new one and it came with lots of features. So you have to make a lot of tests to make sure it works. And that changed. So it's, it changed to the new release cycle, which is this. You see, we have a lot of versions coming out. And um, by the way, who's running, let's start with 17 in production. That's good. 11, eight, and now the question, six and seven? Nobody? Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, we, we have customers with six and seven, so that's why I'm asking. <coughs> well, you see, you have a, we have a lot of these uh, new releases, and there are even new ones you see in, in the future. And that means now you can test a new JDK every six months, which is great because it makes things much easier to switch to a new version. You can test before the next long-term support version will come out, which is a very good thing. And it comes in two different flavors. Uh, there's the JDK and the JRE. All of you know that. It's the Java development kit and it's the Java runtime environment. And now I have to ask you, who's running a JRE in production? Just a few. Who's running JDK in production? You shouldn't do that, right? You know that. You don't need JDK in production because it contains all the stuff that you need to develop stuff, right? So that means the JRE contains the virtual machine, And the class libraries, that's the stuff you need to run things, which is small or smaller. The JDK contains also the Java C compiler, debugger, Java doc, all these things. This is stuff you need for development, right? So that means recommendation, if you are running something up to eight, use the JDK in development, use the JRE in production, right? It's smaller, you save memory, means you save money. If you are running something on nine or greater than nine, You shouldn't use a JRE, you should use JLink. Who's using JLink here? Yes, at least a few people. 
because usually not a lot of people use that. I don't know why, but you can tailor your JDK to the exactly to the your needs. And this is also a security thing because stuff that is not in your, let's say, J-Link build can't also be attacked from the outside, right? So it makes sense to take a look at uh, J-Link, which is a tool to create custom Java runtime images, right? For your application specifically, which is a good thing. <coughs> so, and it's in there since JDK 9. So it's not really new, but still people use JREs if they use it. Okay, so that leads me to the JVM. The JVM it's itself, the Java virtual machine, has different parts. It has a cl class loader subsystem, JVM memory, execution engine, and in these subsystems, it's not only these things, it's more, it's the all these different uh, class loaders for loading. Then we have the linking, we have initialization. This is all the class loader subsystem. In the JVM memory, we have different parts. We have, for example, the method area, the heap, and then uh, stack, PC register, and native method stack. For me, for this session, the interesting part is the execution engine, because this one contains the interpreter. It contains the two compilers in the OpenJDK project, and the profiler, the garbage collectors, and then it has also some native method interface and native method libraries. We come to this point later, but this is how the structure of the JVM roughly looks like, right? Okay. So it's an abstract computing machine. And because I told you already, you don't use the OpenJDK directly, you use a build of the OpenJDK. And this is done by distributions, by vendors, right? And we have different ones. We have builds of OpenJDK, and these are all the different vendors that you find, or distributions, not the vendors, sorry. And there are more, but I just listed the ones that really make sense. So if they have more than 50 different packages, then okay. But if you, everyone can build its own version of the OpenJDK. <coughs> so these distributions that we see here, and by the way, who knows Kona, Tencent Kona? Or who knows, for example, there's another one, Bisheng. Nobody here, right? If I ask that in Asia, people will raise their hands. It's huge in Asia. But because we are in the Western world, we have no idea that there are distributions of the OpenJDK that are widely used in Asia that are not used here, So, wi which is quite interesting. So I think people might know, is it on here? Uh, Dragonwell? Dragonwell from Alibaba? Maybe a few, right? <coughs> yeah, it's interesting. So there these are all these different uh, distributions that you can find. And you see there's this little cross. Who's using still adopt OpenJDK? This is good, because it's dead, right? It died with 1602. And then they made a smart move by, if you downloaded 17, it was suddenly Tamarin, which is not the same distribution. Adopt OpenJDK was a community build where Tamarin is a build of the Eclipse Foundation. They just gave it the very similar name, Adoptium. So people thought, oh, this is the same. It's not the same, right? Just keep that in mind. <coughs> okay, and then there's OJDK build, which is the community build of the Red Hat distribution. And this is also dead now. I think it died with 1707 or something. So then there are others like, um, let me say, OpenLogic. It looked they were dead, but then suddenly they have builds again. So I don't know. And then there's Trava, which is a specific build for Linux. They have from time to time uh, versions, so th it depends, but they have at least a lot of versions available. So this is 20 different distributions. And then there's builds of GraalVM. Who's using GraalVM here? In production, native image, one. Okay, cool. So it's not only GraalVM. We have Glue on GraalVM, which is for mobile and embedded and desktop. Then we have GraalVM community, which is new since last week. Before it was uh, GraalVM CE. Then we have now GraalVM, which is formerly known as GraalVM Enterprise Edition. And then there is Liberica Native Image Kit and Mandrel, which is from Red Hat. Liberica is from Bellsoft. <coughs> so these are the different uh, versions of GraalVM that you can use. And I will come to the different functionalities later because they are not all the same. Okay, th the question is which one to, to choose. Right? It's not easy if you... Usually you come into a project, someone says, okay, we use whatever, Corredo, and then, okay, we use Corredo. If you ask, why don't we use whatever, Zulu? I don't know. We use Corredo. 
right? So the question is which one to choose? And we have to look at some differences between these different JDK distributions. First of all, there's something like term of support. I will explain what it means. Updates, compliance, cost, performance, and then there's also features, right? Because just because they build all from the same source code doesn't mean the end result is the same because you can add stuff, right? And this is what some companies do. So term of support, you've probably heard of that. Short term support version, right? STS. And then there is, this is probably what you heard, is LTS releases, long-term support versions, right? Like 8, 11, 17, 21, 25, and so on. <coughs> and this is how it looks like from JDK 9 on. These are all these different releases. And then you see the STS releases have always six months between them. So that means from 9 to 10, six months, from 10 to 11, six months, and so on. And then the blue ones here, this is the so-called long-term support versions. <coughs> the reason for that is, you see, they have longer support in terms of security updates and patches, where the STS releases only have updates for six months. When the next release comes out, that's it. If you stick to, let's say you go to 13, <coughs> because there was a feature implemented, or 12, then 12.01, 12.02, then 13 comes out. You have to switch to 13 because otherwise you won't get security updates for 12 anymore. So and this goes on until you reach 17 and then you get for, I don't know, till, till I think it's even longer now, till 2030 you will get updates for JDK 17. <coughs> and uh, 8 is even longer than 13, right? So that means if you go to the short-term support versions, you have to be aware that you only have six month security updates and after that you have to switch. Otherwise you run into the risk <coughs> that you, you have a, a vulnerable system, right? So this is important to know. Um, okay, I already mentioned that short term support releases only for six months. After that, game over. Keep that in mind because sometimes <coughs> the thing with the STS releases is they offer new features. So for example, I think it was JDK 14 where they added J package. We have been in a project where we used J package, we needed that. So we switched to JDK 14. And then we had to make the switch every six months to 15, 16, until we reached 17. And this is also risky because with every of these new releases, they introduce new features. They could introduce new issues. So this is, you should be aware of this, right? And then the other thing is not every distribution supports STS and LTS. For example, Dragonwell only has 8, 11, 17. There's no STS, there's no 16, no 15, no 14. And there are also others, they only support the long-term support versions. <coughs> you have to be aware of these things too. That means the recommendation here is for development you can use whatever you like, but in production make sure you stick to a long-term support version because this is really, you can be sure that even after years you get service packs, that means uh, security fixes for it. Next thing, updates. Sounds simple, but probably is not. Who knows CPU updates? Who knows what it is? One, two, oh, that's good, a few. It means critical patch update. <coughs> then there's PSU, that means patch set update. Usually you don't see that on the web. If you download something, you, you download the latest version. <coughs> Some companies say, oh yeah, this contains the fixes for the CPU update. But the difference is the CPU only contains fixes for really critical issues and vulnerabilities, right? The PSU contains the CPU plus it contains also fixes for non-critical issues and for new features. So it can contain new features. And that means it can introduce new issues. Right, so if you, for example, you have a, a new update, 17.07 PSU, you get the fixes from 17.06, but then, oh, there was a new feature, we added that to 17.07 PSU too. So you get the new feature that might be buggy. It was tested, doesn't mean it's really fixed, right? So you have to know this. And you will get these things four times a year, 
and it will look like that. I tried to visualize it. It might be a little bit complex. So on the upper row, we see the PSU updates. <coughs> on the lower one, it's CPU. On the upper one, you see PSU and it contains the CPU, okay? This is in January. Next update in April. And then it introduces fixes and features, the PSU, where the CPU takes the 1701 and only fixes the issues. That's a CPU update. So that means feature-wise, you're always a step behind if you use the CPU, right? I hope this is somehow clear. And then this goes on. Next update, July, same thing. Oh, uh, th that doesn't really look good, okay? But it's, it's the same, right? So the CPU always contains the fixes for the last PSU. Why do I tell you this? Well, I tell you that, and then in October, this is the same again. <coughs> I tell you that because patch set updates, PSUs, this is most of the available distributions that you find, it's PSU. If you use Tamarind, Corretto, whatever, it's only PSU. And that, that's why th the reason is why you don't really see that anywhere because they don't really announce that it's the PSU update. Critical patch updates are only available by Azure, Bellsoft, and Oracle. No other company does that because this is additional effort that you have to you have to spend money and time to build these CPU updates that only contains fixes <coughs> and this is the, the reason is why you don't see it you have to pay for it this is the reason why people pay for Java because they get critical patch updates only and um, I think Tamarin they just say it contains the CPU fixes of course because it's a PSU <coughs> but it also contains new stuff right so you have to keep that in mind CPU only available by these three companies. <coughs> the recommendation is in development you can use whatever you like, right? In production, if you have mission critical stuff, you should stick to a CPU release. Because you really, if you would like to make sure that you really run on the last secured version, then the CPU is the one you need to, to run on. If you don't care, you can also use a PSU, what most of the people do. Okay. Compliance. Oh, that, that's an interesting thing. <coughs> you probably heard about TCK. Who knows what the TCK is? Or heard about it? Heard about the TCK. Okay. It's the Technology Compatibility Kit licensed by Oracle. And uh, <coughs> it was originally developed by Sun Microsystems. Sorry. And it's an intellectual property of Oracle now. And... Uh, it contains, for example, for JDK 11, more than 120,000 tests. You can get this stuff for free. You can take a look at it, and uh, you will be surprised. It tests the complete structure of the language of Java, how we know it. Every class is the, the structure, how it works, the all the variables, all the methods, everything. <coughs> it's really complex, and when we build a new version, for example, it's around 1,000 packages that we have to build. For each package, we have to run these tests. And that takes days to do that. Right? This is another reason why people pay something for Java, because it's really uh, you spend a lot of time on the infrastructure and the people who, who build that stuff. OK. And any binary must pass the test <coughs> to be able to say it's Java SE compatible. That means if you create, for example, on a Mac, you have a DMG and a package, both of them have to run the tests. It's not enough just to run it once and then create the package. No, you have to run it for each of the binaries, which is really a lot of work. <coughs> and the real thing that you run in the background is the JCK. That's the Java Compatibility Kit. This is the stuff that is running. The TCK is more like an umbrella and it contains the JCK because I, I mentioned that because some companies don't say we are TCK compliance, they say we are JCK compliance. And then you know, okay, that's the same. Right. <coughs> the JCK, <coughs> it tests features that are likely to differ across implementations, rely on hardware operating system specific behavior, are difficult to port, either mask abstract hardware behavior or, even or operating system behavior. So this is, uh, this is the actual test. And for example, if you would like to build your own JDK and make it TCK compliant, you can download the JDK source code, you can download the test, and good luck with running it, because it really will take days on your local machine, 
takes forever. I, I started it once and then I gave up after a day because it was it looked like n nothing happens. And then I saw, okay, it, it really did something, but it took too long. So the question is, how can you get access to it? So you can get it without charge, right? Uh, you must meet the terms of the OCTLA, which is the Open JDK Community TCK License Agreement. What a nice name. That means a lot of paperwork, right? You must sign the OCA, the Oracle Contributing Agreement. More paperwork, but it's all for free. <coughs> and then you get it. And these are the distributions that really are compliant to TCK for JDK 8. Because that's another difference. Just because you have it for JDK 8 doesn't mean you also have it for 11, right? <coughs> you see that Dragon Well here, they are TCK compliant for JDK 8. And, uh, and you also see this is not 20 distributions anymore, right? So it's not the list that we saw in the beginning. That means not every JDK that you download is TCK compliant. That's another thing you have to keep in mind. And when you see the tests, it really makes sense to use a JDK that is TCK compliant because that makes sure that you can change, for example, from Corredo 8 to Oracle Open JDK or to Zulu, and it will guarantee that it will work on that JDK. If you try to run it on another JDK that's not TCK uh, compliant, for example, on 8, it might fail. And this happens, for example, for Dragonwell, it runs on 8, they have TCK, for 9 and above, they don't have because they implemented features in 11 or I think even in 9 that don't pass the test. So they can't say we are TCK compliant. And that means if you use it, it might fail, right? So this is stuff you also need to know about the JCK, the TCK, and the uh, uh, distributions that support these different uh, test suites. <coughs> then there's another one, it's a new one. Who knows Aquavit? Okay, a few. This is uh, Adaptium Quality Assurance Vitality and Speed Test Suite. Wow, another great name by Eclipse. <coughs> and the idea was born to have something that that is, I wouldn't say it's a replacement for TCK, it's an addition to the TCK. It's a different test suite. And um, the idea is, you if, to you if you would like to pass this one, you have to pass the TCK first. Right, so only the ones that pass TCK can get the Aquavit test. Otherwise, you can't get it. And um, the reason why that was invented, <coughs> or one reason is, y who knows Adapt Open JDK? I guess most of you, right? Who knows why they have to change to Adoptium? <coughs> Nobody. One. The reason is there was Open JDK in the name, and Oracle said we don't like that you don't get the TCK and we would like to change your name. So they had to change the name. That was the reason why they went to the Eclipse Foundation and named it Adoptium because Adopt Open JDK was not allowed. And then they decided we need something that is e equivalent to the TCK test and they invented the Aquavit, right? So Aquavit is a little bit different. <coughs> they ensure that uh, it's more like on the the TCK tests really Java, where the Aquavit tests how the JDK behaves on real-world application tests, right, for production use. It's a little bit different, and this is also the reason why you have to pass the TCK first to be able to also pass the Aquavit test. So this, is you see, it's a lot of tests, more than 350,000 tests that are running for that. And uh, yeah, like I said, it's designed to test real-world utilization patterns on the JDK distribution and also security, durability tests, and so on and so on. And this is only, that's the only distribution that pass this test. And you guess right, Dragonwell only for JDK 8 because in 11 they don't pass the TCK, right? <coughs> There's another thing, Samaru certified is from IBM. It's the OpenJ9 thing. <coughs> the problem with this one is because OpenJ9 is not really based on OpenJDK, IBM implemented their own Java version or their own JDK and they implemented it from scratch. So it's not based on open JDK. And so Oracle said, hmm, if you would like to have the TCK license, usually it's free, but for you, you have to pay. That's the reason why we have Samaru and Samaru certified. The certified version passes the TCK test. 
and with this it's allowed to also pass the aqua wit okay you see it's quite interesting with oracle sometimes um recommendation of course in development do what you want production make sure you use something that is tck licensed right this is where i think it's really important because in the future if you have to switch to another jdk version it might break if you don't really use a tck compliant jdk distribution <coughs> The next thing is costs. Who's paying for Java in this room? Or the company? A few? That's good. We are used to use everything for free, right? This is how it works. Well, <coughs> not everything is for free. Um, all these distributions are for free. You can use them even in production for free. There is this GraalVM little asterisk. Means you can use it for some time for free. Another Oracle specific thing. Because uh, last week they changed everything. <coughs> they first of all announced the GraalVM community and then GraalVM, formerly Enterprise. And the idea is, if I got it right, if you have GraalVM based on 17, they now have the same version numbers as the JDKs. GraalVM 17, you can use until 28 comes out one year later, after it came out, you can use it for free. And then it will switch to the OTN license. Oh, and that's a fun thing because suddenly you have to pay, and I will come to that on the next slide, um, you have to pay for Prime, for example, this is all JVM, IBM Samaru, but the interesting part is this one. Usually it was based on the number of V cores, right, for GraalVM, and for Oracle JDK is the same. But then they had this nice idea in January, well, hmm, if, if we would like to make money out of Java, we have to change something. And they change that to numbers of employees. And that doesn't only mean your company, it means third-party companies that help you to do your job. Now think about a company like Mercedes-Benz. They have a lot of employees. And if they have a third-party company like Bosch, oh, another, many, many employees they have, right? <coughs> if they have a license for, let's say, JDK from Oracle, and they have 1,000 licenses. And now one more engineer downloads the, open the JDK version from Oracle from the website, and they have 1,001. Then they apply to the new licensing system. And suddenly Oracle can come and say, okay, we have 150,000 employees, now you pay for 150,000. We don't care if you have people that never use Java. This is the new licensing scheme. And that changed on January 21st. You can look it up. It's really interesting. So be careful. If you who's using Oracle JDK here? Okay. So you you really have to check that. It's 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 critical. Just saying. And this also applies for GraalVM. Like I said, it's free to use until one year after the next LTS, and suddenly it drops back to OTN license, which means then you have to pay. You have to keep that in mind right especially if you work in a bigger company because they're aiming to get the money from the big companies not the small ones <coughs> so it's really um, have to be careful with that performance yeah that's maybe something interesting performance uh, first of all we have something like a baseline performance that applies to all of these distributions because i told you they're all based on open jdk that means all of them more or less same performance why should it be different, right? Because of the same source code. <coughs> yes, some distributions add some minor tweaks, but this is not really something that is worth measuring. And that means it doesn't really matter if you aim for performance, which of the JDKs you use, as long as it's just based on open JDK. If you look for something that needs high performance, then there are just a few options, right? And for that, we have to take a look again at the JVM and specifically at the execution engine. Because there's the magic happens in this area there, especially here, the JIT compilers and the garbage collectors. And this is the stuff you can replace, and it has an impact on performance. And uh, there are just two companies who, doing, who's do who are doing that. So there's, for example, the first thing is our own platform Prime. I will come to that in a second, what we do differently. We change the compiler and the garbage collector. And then there's Oracle GraalVM, formerly Enterprise Edition, they have also different compiler. <coughs> they have not even that, they have even more, but, but this is uh, 
that's the only two JVMs that have higher performance if you measure them as the average. IBM Samaru is sometimes faster, but not really a lot. So it doesn't reach this performance, but it, it sometimes is faster than the normal Oracle OpenJDK based stuff because they use the OpenJ9 compiler, which is different and um, can sometimes produce faster code. Okay. A faster JVM helps reducing cloud cost, right? Because you can imagine if you have your normal OpenJDK and you run your workload and y y let's say you need 100% of the CPU <coughs> and now we give you a JVM that can do the same but you only need 50% because it can create faster code. Then of course you just need 50% of the CPU and that lowers the cost, right? So this, uh, we have to keep that in mind that there's a relation between that. Features, and that's the interesting part now. We have Amazon Corredo. <coughs> who's using Amazon Corredo? If you, who's using Snapstart? Wow, cool. Um, yeah, because it comes with Snapstart, which is the, it uses the API of Crack that we invented last year and made an open JDK project. And then they also use Firecracker in combination with that um, to help with Lambda startup. And it's now available for 11 and 17 as far as I know. So that makes it different from the normal open JDK builds. Then we have Alibaba Dragonwell. Um, and this has some special, special features like it has a standard and extended edition. And the extended edition is the one that fails, <coughs> the TCK, because it comes with the JVM or J warm up <coughs> where they try to save optimizations done by the compiler. And the next time you run your code, they try to apply them and just skip the whole warm up phase of the JVM. And then also they have an elastic heap where they return GC memory to the operating system. And they have something called WISP2, which is a stackful symmetric coroutine at JVM level. All of this stuff is implemented to make it run better on the Alibaba cloud, because this is also big in China. And this is, like I said, this is the problem. They break the TCK with, the, with this J warm up. And I have to say that this is based on work that we did a couple of years back before we added to our own JVM ready now, and they saw our work which was open source at that time and they just copied it but there was a reason why we did it differently and now, no, they, now they have the problem with the TCK. Okay, <coughs> Tencent Kona, I asked already, nobody knows it, right? But who's, is someone working in embedded here on ARM devices with Java? Automotive or something? Nobody? Tencent Kona is specialized on ARM. So, um, they implemented Kona fibers in JDK 8 and 11, which is more or less the same than Loom. That means the virtual threads and all these things. But they already did that, I think, two years back. And they have on their website tests where they prove that Kona fibers are faster than Loom. And they implemented it because for embedded devices, this is very critical. If you can do that, it's great, right? Because you have limited resources. So they do that for JDK 8 and 11. And they also have ZGC for ARM. Again, for embedded devices, ZGC is a really good thing. They did the implementation for ARM and um, they use it. So it's, it's quite good. The rest is based on OpenJDK. Then we have Bellsoft Liberica. And they also have a special feature because they come bundled with JavaFX. Is someone doing JavaFX here? <coughs> wow. One, two, three. Cool. I'm not alone. So, um, yeah, you get a bundled version, version with the JavaFX <coughs> that behaves like JDK 8 did where it came with the JDK. It was never part of the JDK. It was came only, only bundled with the JDK. So, and Bellsoft offers that. Then we have Liberica NIC, which is the native image kit, which is the build of Graal VM from Bellsoft. And this is quite interesting because this also comes with JavaFX. That means if you would like to build a native desktop application that uses JavaFX, you can use this one. You can create a native binary that means one file of your application if you use JavaFX on desktop and create it with, with this uh, Liberica NIC distribution, which is quite interesting. So it's the only one that comes with that. 
Then we have Oracle Graph. I already mentioned that. It, there's a community and formerly Enterprise Edition. <laughs> now it's only GraalVM. And um, come on. It is, has a polyglot VM. It means it supports multiple languages. And it comes with a GraalJIT compiler. This is uh, like the replacement for the C2 compiler. And it's written in Java. So that was the main idea of GraalVM way back. I think it's more than 10 years ago. And I remember that when it was in Oracle Labs that the people had the idea the C2 compiler is was written by Sun. It's quite good, but it's very hard to maintain. And they had the idea if we write that in Java, then it's much easier to maintain that compiler. And so it all started, right? It took a lot of time to do it. And then they add the native image thing and all these things. Um, and that lead to or led to GraalVM in the end. So they have this JIT compiler, they have an AOT compiler for the native image stuff. Um, then we have IBM Samaru, which is a completely different implementation of the JVM spec. It has a community and certified edition. I already explained why they have a certified edition, why they have to pay for it. And it's based on OpenJ9, which has usually faster startup than OpenJDK. And the memory footprint is also lower with this JVM. So is someone using Samaru? One, okay. It also comes with an AOT compiler. And they say um, it's dynamically compiled I AOT code. Um, yeah, that's something that doesn't really work together for me, like dynamically and AOT, but okay, because AOT usually is static, right? So but that, that's what they say. <coughs> you have the ability to do AOT compilation of Java code, which is not the same as you we have in GraalVM, right? It's just they compile parts. I think it's parts that are used will be pre-compiled. And then the next time it directly uses that. They have instant on, which is the same that crack is just for the IBM Samaru JVM because this one is different, but it's exactly the same. The only difference is they have a different API. They have an IBM style API, which is a more scientific API, not very useful, but it works. Yeah, to name it like that. Um, and they have a JIT server, which is quite interesting. We have also the same. So that means you can run Samaru on a server and then you can have different Samaru versions on different machines and they can ask the cloud compiler or the server compiler to compile code. And the next time another version asks for the same code, the, the central web compiler here, the, the JIT server will di directly return the compiled code. So you don't have to compile it locally anymore. That's the idea. Oh, then we have Zulu, which is our own JVM. And this one comes with JavaFX. We also bundle it like uh, Liberica does. We have Azure vulnerability detection. So we figured out that who's using security scanning in production here? A, a few people. I, I guess you use an agent to do that because th that's the only way you can do it. <coughs> if you use an agent, that means you start a, s a, a program that connects to the JVM at runtime and it implements some callbacks to the JVM and for example it tells the JVM every time you load a class let me know. So that means every time the JVM loads a class it will call back to the agent. The agent will do something and go back. So this is the how it works and usually it comes with a performance overhead of 10% at least. And we thought how why should we do that? The JVM already knows what it loads, right? So what we did we created a little tool which we call forwarder that you uh, install in your own infrastructure and then the JVM will talk to the forwarder from time to time and will just tell the forwarder, oh, by the way, I loaded these classes and that stuff. You don't need callbacks and the overhead is below 1% and we can do that in production. The biggest advantage of this stuff is we can tell you if you really use code. Whereas the ICD security scanner can tell you, oh, you have a, a dependency on log4j and this is really vulnerable. Yes, okay. In production, we can tell you, oh yes, you have the dependency, you never load the class. No problem. Right? Because the JVM knows the classes it loads. Right? This is how we do the vulnerability detection. This is only for Java, it's only in production. <coughs> then we have Crack are already, who knows Crack? Yes, I did a good job last year. Um, Coordinated restore checkpoint means you can run a JVM with your code 
and at some point you decide I will stop now and then you can restore from that checkpoint in milliseconds like 30 to 50 milliseconds depending on how large the checkpoint was and then it will continue running exactly at the same point where you stopped it and this is already available so you can we support that um, if for example if you download on the Azure website the latest Zulu version there is a version with crack and we will from now on every version will get an update even with crack and if you run into problems we will support that so it's not a uh, pre-version or better version anymore it's now an official version and we're also working on a, on a job to to make it really part of the JDK then we have Azure Platform Prime that's our premium JVM and there we have a different compiler which is based on LLVM which creates much faster code than the the C2 compiler. We have a C4 garbage collection. This is in principle the ZGC or let's say the ZGC is a copy of the C4 because we did that 10 years ago and we have a patent on that one but ZGC does exactly that and we have ready now. <coughs> this is because we have the compiler we can tell the compiler to save all the optimizations and de-optimizations it did and then the next time you start your application we directly tell the compiler you know what instead of trying every optimization just use this one because that worked last time it's the best you can do right you can really warm up much faster uh, we have also this cloud native optimizer that means you can run a cluster of compilers in the cloud and then when you run your microservices every time a method will be called the cloud native optimizer will just keep the compiled method and the next time you call it, you directly get the highest optimized code back. So that can also help you. And it also has the same vulnerability detection that we have in Zulu. And crack will come probably maybe in August. I'm not sure yet. So, But it will also come to Prime. And this one you have to pay for. Sorry, but we spend so much money on that thing that we need to make some money out of it. And with that, let me check. the. Oh, it's good. I'm really good. Uh, the takeaway... It's not really fancy, right? It's a lot of stuff uh, that's just the way it is. Are all those builds of OpenJDK really different? Well, technically, no. It's more or less the same. There's not a big difference there. Uh, service support and cost, probably yes. So that means if you need service or support, or if you have to pay for something, of course it's different. And when people, we had that yesterday, where people come to the booth and ask, why are people paying for Java? So I asked them, do you have a fire insurance? Yes, of course. Did it ever burn your house down? No. Why do you pay? Right? The same thing. We just do that. We do the support that in case there is a problem, we can help you. That's what you pay for. And for the CPU updates, of course. So choose wisely when selecting a JDK. And thanks for attending. <laughs>